Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. What a wonderful uh, song. Thank you, choir and orchestra. And pastor, thank you so much for the invite to be here. Uh, This is the truth, and I'm just going to tell the truth. My flight was delayed, and I flew out tonight to come here out of international concourse. And I told people through the years that you have to have a visa to get in to Alabama. And I, when I went over to E27, seriously, international, Brother Danny, I thought, you, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get over there without my passport, but they let me. But I, I have picked on Alabama so much, but let me just give you the skinny. In all of the years of all of the conferences I have done, and I have hosted my share of them, no one has supported me like Alabama Baptist. So thank you so much. Every conference I've hosted at Woodstock, all our Timothy Barnabas schools, and so thank you much. I noticed um, that, Lord willing, I'll be back in your state in January for a Who's Your One, and I'm going to talk about that. It's in Birmingham. Hope you'll bring your lay people. Here's the fact. I mean, it's just, I wrote about it in a leadership book years ago. Whatever's important to the pastor is what's important to the people. And so we got to get our pastors, again, rallying our people in evangelism. So we'll talk about that. And they wanted me to mention to you that I I brought a book that I gave you. It's a series of messages. One person said, how can I get hold of the message you preached on uh, what is a disciple? I think I wrote eight or ten messages. It's in that book. So just a gift to you, pastor. So my spiritual gift is encouragement. So let me take a minute of my preaching time to encourage you. Um, We're at a seven-decade low in evangelism. I don't want to do any more research in this area because what I found is not pretty. Now, we baptized more people in 1970. Now, hear me carefully. We had nine million less members. That means we were half the size we were, and we went in more people to Jesus. Now, this is really something. In 1970, the Southern Baptist Convention had never given a billion dollars in plate money in our churches. We gave over 12 billion last year. We've given 12 times as much money, uh, 9 million more members, and we're at a seven-year decade. B- bottom line is there was a day Southern Baptists would say this. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, here's what we know, too. Uh, since faith, which so- sort of started fading in the, se- in, in, in the end of the 90s, we didn't replace it. So as a result, best we can ascertain, about 80% of our churches are not trained in evangelism. And it's not enough to just preach who's your one. You've got to now train the people uh, to go and reach their one. And so we're seeing some encouraging things happen all across the nation. We really, really, really are. Uh, but I just want to encourage you. Uh, you you've not only got to preach evangelism, you've got to model it. You, you got to model. Uh, I was on the plane. You may think it's crazy. And I was uh, telling the young man that uh, picked me up, and I really appreciate him uh, accommodating us tonight, uh, running late and all. But, but I just said, I said, even on the plane, I found out my one, my one moved to California today. <laughs> And I, I've shared the gospel with him twice, so I uh, thought I've shared the gospel, so I text him the gospel again. Uh, and then I even hear people say, I'm praying God will send somebody by my daddy's house. L- look at me for a moment. Don't pray for God to send anybody by until you go. Then pray God would send others to water it. But in Jesus' name, quit praying for God to raise somebody up to do what he's called us to do. We just got to, we got to get back. So, so we're starting to turn it. Now, let me give you my vision. God's put something in my heart about evangelism. Here it is. On any given Sunday morning in Southern Baptist life, 5,297,000 and some change show up for worship. Numbers came out again yesterday. Some people debate it. We have 47,000 churches. We have about 3,000 mission points, 50,000 places where the gospel's being preached on the Lord's day. 5,297,000 change showing up. Listen carefully. If one out of every 10 people that come to our churches, and now we're talking active there every Sunday. 
If they led one person to Jesus over the next 12 months, in other words, they became intentional, like God, lay some soul upon my heart, love that soul through me. And if you're struggling with who could that one be, like you can't come up with anybody, let me help you. Is everybody in your extended family saved? I know they're not because everybody's got a crazy uncle. I mean, I'm just telling you, you got to, it's facts. Uh, number two, are all of your neighbors Christ followers? Everybody you work with know Jesus? And so you, you get a name, and in the back of my Bible, I've got the name, and now I'm going to stay behind Percy. And I gave him the gospel again. I said, uh, Percy, we need to have a conversation. We need to talk. Uh, I enjoyed the last conversation, but I'm really burdened. And then I've got a brother that uh, claims to be saved. Oh, gosh, where do I quit with this? I need to preach what I came to preach. But uh, I got a brother, and, and look at me for a moment, and he claims he's saved. How many of you can say this? And you're not trying to be judgmental. You just got a Bible. And here's what we know. There's no evidence. There's nothing in his life that resembles a disciple. Nothing. He said to me one day, he said, you, you don't think I'm going to make it, do you? And I said, I'll tell you this. I wouldn't want to face heaven with what I see demonstrated in your life. I would have no confidence if I had what you've got. And, and I told him tonight, and I could read the text to you. I just texted him one guy and said, Freddie, uh, none of the promises and provisions that God promises when you become a Christian are a reality in your life. So I know what some of you are saying. Yeah, uh, my brother, he's a Christian, uh, but he hadn't been to church lately. So how old's your brother? 44. When did he quit coming? He hadn't been since he was eight. <laughs> look, look at me. That may be a decision, but it's not a disciple. And a decision does not have a seed in it. God places the seed of God in you. When you get saved, read 1 John. So, I just, so there's some people we're praying will get right that really need to get saved. Anyway, thanks for listening. So here it is. If one in 10, all right, one in 10, lead one person to Christ, we would, bab we would double baptisms. Wait a minute, I'm not through. We would baptize more people than we've ever baptized since we started in 1845. Let me tell you what I call that. I wish I had more time to talk about this. That's why you got to come to Who's Your One rally. I'm fired up about that. But anyway, there's, it's just a small tweak. It really is. It's just a small tweak. It's, an, it's, a, it's a minor adjustment for us to get back online. Now, we're talking about the cross, aren't we? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Hey, thanks for letting me come. I, uh, I've looked out. Some of you sent me text and uh, before I got here and since I got here and some of you have spoken. I, I love my pastor buddies. I, you, some of you and I haven't met or some of you haven't, don't know that well and others of you are really, um, man, my forever friends. I thank God for you. I love my pastor, brethren and sistren. So um, my wife says the way you say sisters Reminds me of the cisterns in Israel. So anyway, it uh, sounds like that. I want to speak tonight on this subject. It's still the cross. It's still the cross. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, would you honor the word of God and just stand to your feet? Beginning in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And then Paul gives a biblical illustration. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? And where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now listen to this statement. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. Wow, really? Um, Robbie Zacharias told me recently. He said, Johnny, always remember, a person getting saved is more of a moral decision than an intellectual decision. Have you ever been preaching and somebody say, hold it, hold, I get it now, I get it. It, it, it all came together. No. Matter of fact, I have people all the time telling me on planes that if, if I could answer the questions, they'd become a Christian. Had a guy told me the other day, he said, so you're a preacher. I've always wanted to ask this, and I'll just be honest. When somebody can give me the proper answer, I can believe I'll become a Christian. 
Now, that's interesting right here on the plane. And I said, so what is that? He said, where did Cain get his wife? So I thought I'd have fun. And by the way, some of you would enjoy your ministry more if you'd get a sense of humor. <laughs> so, so I have fun. I mean, I really do have fun. So what I did, he said, so if you can tell me where Cain got his wife, I'll become a Christian. So I intentionally, I didn't say anything. He said, hey, hey, preacher, did you hear me? He said, what do you think? I said, you just got to go to hell. <laughs> I did, I did. God is my witness. Uh, can, can you imagine, can you imagine that little boy getting up in church and saying, I want to give a testimony. I was on a plane and I found out where Cain got his wife and God radically changed my life. <laughs> it, it, it's so fun. I, 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 I have to study for my sermons on the plane because I stay on one every day. And so I was, I was writing a sermon the other day, and a guy said, so you, you teach that book? And I know you're still standing, and I'll be through in just a minute. I'll let you sit. And some, some of you are getting more exercise than you've had all week. So anyway, I, uh, he said, you, uh, you teach that book? And I said, yeah, yes, sir, I do. He said, like are, like, like, are you a preacher? And I said, yeah, yes, sir, I am. Like, like, do you have a church? Yeah, yes, sir, I do. And... Uh, so he said, I, I've never have gotten much out of that. I said, oh, just this morning I was meditating on great truth. And he said, what is that? you mind sharing it? I said, well, the righteous man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. He, he said, would you say that again? He, he liked it. And so he got something to write with. The righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. He said, who said that? I said, uh, Solomon. He said, last name? I said, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> The world through wisdom than not knowing. For by grace are you saved through faith. Uh, that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Jesus is the one who changes people's lives. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greek, it's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Father, speak in our time. Encourage us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. In verse 17 of this passage, Paul clarifies the nature of his mission, namely to preach the gospel. He, he proceeded to identify the central features of the preaching of the gospel, namely the cross of Christ. For over 2,000 years, the sign and symbol of the Christian faith has been the old rugged cross. It's the message of the cross, which is the heart of of the gospel, God at the cross atoned for my sins. He took my sin out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Some of the church's greatest hymns and songs are about the cross. I love the old rugged cross, uh, the song at Calvary, at the cross. Uh, my wife's favorite song, and when I was at Southeastern Seminary, I wrote a paper on Isaac Watts' song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Uh, Paul made a tremendous statement concerning the cross. In Galatians 6, 14, he said, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was said of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Mr. Spurgeon, all of your sermons sound exactly the same. Why is that? Spurgeon responded, because I just take a text anywhere in the Bible and then make a beeline straight to the cross. And so what I want to do is talk about two things in this passage. I want to deal, first of all, with the dynamics of the cross. In verse 18, the Bible refers to this message as the message of the cross. He uses uh, the word there, or logos. It speaks of the whole totality of truth contained in and revealed through the cross. So the cross was the heart of the gospel and the central theme of Christianity. So the word of the cross includes the entire 
gospel message and work, God's plan and provision for man's redemption. So Christ's work on the cross is the pinnacle of God's revealed word. No wonder Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So when he deals with the dynamics of the cross, I lifted three things out. First of all, he started by reminding us of the foolishness of the cross. He, he, he makes this statement, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The word foolishness is where we derive our English word moron. It means moronic. It, it, here's what it translates. Absolute nonsense. Absurdity. Think with me for a moment. The Lord Jesus Christ calls you to preach and he gives you a message that is a message to the average mind of absurdity. And, and I'm going to tell you why. why. Why would you say absurdity? That anything significant should be accomplished through the death of a carpenter of Nazareth was sheer absurdity to the Greek mind. That one man, even the Son of God, could die on a piece of wood on a nondescript hill in a nondescript part of the world and thereby, wait a minute, determine the destiny of every person who has ever lived and ever would live seemed stupid. It allows no place for man's merit, no place for man's obtainment, no place for man's understanding, no place for man's pride. So think about that. So when somebody says, that doesn't make sense, it never will. That's why God initiates salvation. You know, a man says, you know, I heard your message and I, I, I've heard enough about I need to become a Christian. And when, when I'm ready, I will get saved. No, you won't because you'll never be ready. Uh, only the Holy Spirit of God with the gospel readies a person to come to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, bottom line is, I was probably just like you. I was minding my own business, managing a pool room, lost without God, high school dropout, troublemaker, when somebody pleaded with me to go to church. And just for the record's sake, and I'm telling you, we've got to get this right. I am so tired of hearing other preachers criticize preachers in our convention by saying, you don't just invite them to church. You need to give them the gospel. Just for the record's sake, 85% of the people ever baptized in our church came to church out of a simple invitation. I'm a Christian tonight because a carpenter named N.W. Pridgen in Wilmington, North Carolina would not leave me alone. Get your pretty wife and bring her to church. Now, do I share the gospel? Absolutely. I do the work of an evangelist. I love to share the gospel. But I'm constantly begging people to come with me. Two things encourage me about evangelism right now in the message of the cross. Number one, in a recent survey from Lifeway, when they asked what was the most discouraging thing happening in the life of the lead pastor, it was the lack of growth in his church. So that means he's ready for something to come along to see that change for the glory of God. Uh, number two, Lifeway did research on why is it we're so low in baptisms. Are you ready? Number one was our people have all started coming to church by themselves. We no longer bring people with us. The whole dynamic of the worship service would change. Instead of thinking, when's this going to be over? You would be praying I mean intentionally. I mean fervent prayers. Oh, God, speak through the pastor. Fill the choir with the Spirit of God. Permeate this place for the glory of Christ and draw, almighty God, this person to yourself. I guarantee you bring a lost person with you. You won't leave during the invitation. I apologize to our people recently. I said, I have confused so many of you. I invite y'all to come to Christ and come get right with God. And you th thought I meant out in the lobby. And it's down here. <laughs> I'm inviting. I said, so here's what I said. I said, so today, I, I take this one. I own it. It's my fault. Today, when you leave, counselors will be out in the lobby waiting on you. <laughs> Nobody responded. Everybody stayed put. It lasts about two weeks. It's not all it lasts. Yeah, two weeks. 
So this is how the cross is viewed by unbelievers who rely on their own wisdom. You're trying to figure it out. So you're trying to tell me that a man that died 2,000 years ago in a nondescript place in the Middle East of all places, that he determines the destiny of every person who ever live. That's exactly right. But let me go a step further. Then Paul moves into the force of the cross. He, he's going to get, I love this. He's going to, um, to talk about the power of God. He says the, um, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but those who are being saved, it's the power of God. So the one group is asking, how, how can the blood of such a person remove sin uh, give righteousness and guaranteed hope beyond the grave. No wonder years ago when we went through a bout with theological liberalism in our own denomination, a lot of people were saying, we want to get that slaughterhouse religion out because it really became pretty offensive that we would actually sing about the blood. But how many of you still know that there's power in the blood? How many of you know that what can wash away my sins? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so the, the, the power of God, here's a great way to say it. The dynamic of Jesus Christ and the cross is in the power of God. The, the vindication of the cross is not wisdom in that it makes sense, but power in that it works. You know, or saved out of a pool room, I'd been arrested for stealing. I'd been arrested for fighting. Some of you think fighting, you're not very big. I'm wound tight, brother, all right? So the bottom, bottom line is, uh, stayed in and out of trouble. I'll never forget, when I got saved, one of my friends was in jail. So I'm riding down uh, Market Street in Wilmington, North Carolina, and hear the horn blow, and I look over, and there he is. There's Richard Bennett. We, we nicknamed him because he came from the town of Aberdeen, North Carolina. We were best buds in school, so got out and we embraced, and man, I've missed you. And then it was, what is this stuff I am hearing? Religion, get, you, come on, tell me. This is not real, is it? And, hey, Aberdeen, I, God saved me. I, I mean, and, and I got my own story, okay, so leave me alone. Let me tell my story. My story is, hey, Aberdeen, I, I don't drink anymore. Uh, I mean, God, if, if, I don't care what you think about it. God saved me from alcohol. So you go on drinking if you want to. God saved me from it. And I'll tell you, one day, you keep messing with it, you'll need to get saved from it. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was quiet. <laughs> I'm leaving after the service, all right? So, so bottom line is God saved me from it. I mean, I'm, I just told him my story. I don't, I don't smoke anymore. Um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said when he got converted, he lost 80% of his vocabulary. God, God cleaned up that old pool room language. I, I, I checked this on the internet the other day. I managed to pool room for four years. I hustled pool for four years. And so when a, a girl would walk into the pool room, and many girls back in that day did not walk into the type pool room that I managed. But if they did, I had to stand up, kind of like leopard, and holler something. Red board! And I thought, do they still do that? And I Googled red board the other day. And sure enough, it's what the manager of the pool room still hollers when the lady walks into the room. Why? Because we had such filthy mouth. But here's what, here's what Richard Bennett said. I never believed any of that. But you got me thinking. Because now I'm thinking, if there is no God, what in the world happened to my friend Johnny Hunt? And, and just for the record's sake, he's, he's sur since then, he's surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And so it's not always, stay with me now, it's not always wisdom in that it makes sense, but it's power in that it works. Um, uh, so I see, I don't, the last thing I want to do is leave Alabama and you thinking I'm trying to drop names. I don't want to do that. Robbie Zacharias lives close to me and we've just been really good friends for years. I dedicated his new uh, center of apologetics. I preached his 25th anniversary celebration. He, we're just friends. I don't, I, I don't know why scholars are attracted to a hot-hearted gospel preacher. I mean, I know my lane in life. I'm just, when I was at Garden of Webb College, I'd been saved three, three years when I started pastoring my first church. And I remember one of my professors one time, he said, what do you think about Johnny Hunt? And he said, I'll tell you what I think. He's ignorant as on fire. And, um, and, but later, later on in life, I was introduced. I'll never forget as long as I live at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And Ken Hemphill said this. He said, Johnny Hunt's been known 
in his early days to be ignorance on fire. And then he began to weep, and here's what he said. Brother Ed, listen to this. I'd rather be ignorance on fire than intellect on ice. You might know more, but if you're not telling it, what good is that doing? I don't want to sit in a coffee shop and debate with you what I know. I want to tell that lost sinner how Jesus changed my life and see him gloriously come to the Son of God. The power of God, it changes lives. And by the way, that's what we need to get back to. Not how many joined or how many showed up, how many seats we got in our seats, but how many souls are now on their way to heaven because Jesus changed their life. No change, no Christ. It makes saints out of sinners, preachers out of blasphemers. The cross is the manifestation of the power of God. And then, I love this, Paul then moves into an illustration. And he uses a biblical illustration. So in verse number 19, he quotes Isaiah 29, verse 14. Pastor Johnny, what's going on in this passage? He's, he's making reference to what these people that are listening to him would know about an event in Israel's past. You may remember this story. The Assyrians threatened Judah. The counselors of the Jewish king advised an alliance with Egypt. The prophet Isaiah opposed and appealed to trust in God alone. Isaiah was mocked. What happened? They made the alliance, but the problem is Egypt didn't show up, but God did. And when God showed up, one angel killed 186,000 Assyrians. Can I get a witness? I mean, so men have devised their own programs of personal and social redemption in which they trust themselves and not God. And here's Paul said, I'm going to preach a message, and in this message is the power of God. I, I love to tell this story. i got a friend named Rocky. And Rocky is rough. Oh, my stars. He, he is. He would be. If you'll look up Georgia Redneck, Rocky's picture's there. <laughs> Fight at the drop of a hat, furnish the hat. Just, just mean as a junkyard dog. I don't know if you've ever known anybody like that. His wife told the story, and then he began to tell it. He said to his wife, Runan, honey, um, Mother's Day's coming. I want to do something special. So you've been such a great wife, such a great mother. I just want to ask anything you request of me. Mother's Day weekend is yours. Rocky, I want you to go to church with me. So Rocky comes to church. And really, you know, it's really, you know the attitude, you've seen it. You know, bless me if you can. You know, just don't, he don't like it. It's, you know, anybody can endure an hour, right? Unless the power of God's there. Come on, stay with me. The only hope we've got when lost people come is the power of God. Amen. He came down the center aisle right where I was hosting the invitation. He's crying. I don't know him. So I always ask this question. Always. I just said, sir, why are you coming? Answer. I don't know. I don't like you. I don't like this church. But while you were praying, something happened. When I first got saved, Baptists weren't meeting enough. I'm telling you, y'all weren't meeting enough. I'd go Sunday, Wednesday. I mean, because I had to catch up. You know, I'm 20, never been to church. So I would go anywhere, and I didn't know there was, you know, difference in denominations. I didn't know there was an Old Testament, New Testament. I thought Jews were people that charged too much for their merchandise. I didn't know there were chase, chase rights. I'm telling you, I had, I, had no, I had no GPS to the things of God. None. So they said, there's a Church of God camp meeting. And, and it was interesting. And I, I love the Church of God brothers and sisters. I really do. I, I, I really believe I'd fit well with them. And... Uh, but I'll never forget an old song. Isn't this amazing that you can remember something and you can't forget it? They begin to sing an old song. While I was praying, somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of the Lord. Glory, 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 glory. Somebody touched me. Uh, while they were preaching, come on now, somebody touched me. 
must have been the hand of the Lord. And, and what other explanation is there than a man that doesn't want to be there? He doesn't like the church, doesn't like the preacher. But God out of heaven reaches down, initiates something in his heart, through the gospel, and gloriously changes his life. It's still the cross. It's still the cross. Let let me move to a second and and thought, and then we'll um, try to land. There's the dynamics of the cross. But there's the dividing of the cross in verses 18 and 21. So I just wrote this statement. The cross is a great divider. It divides. See, the cross stands between you and heaven or it stands between you and hell. See, there's a, a cross. And if I understand the gospel, you can't go to heaven without the cross. We used to sing it. The way of the cross leads home. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way for me. So we preach the cross. So the cross stands between me and heaven. And then I embrace the cross. And so I'm going to heaven because of the cross. I'm not going to heaven because I'm better than anyone else. I'm going to heaven because of the cross. But also the cross stands between me and hell. I can't go to hell. See how Baptist y'all are. Because of the cross. I, I've embraced the cross. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get bolder. I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. <laughs> Let me just see how solid you are in your doctrine of the atonement. What shall separate me from the love of God? But isn't it amazing, that's in Romans 8, that he says nothing can separate him. And in chapter 9 and verse 3, you would think he didn't pen chapter 8 because he said, I could wish myself damned. And that's the word he used. Anathema, check A.T. Robinson, great Greek scholar. Damned. I could wish my own self doomed, eternally separated from God. He just said that's an impossibility. There comes a time. Where you preach beyond your reason. Your emotions so consume you. Because you're so broken and so passionate over lost people. That you're willing to just say whatever it takes. They tell me there was a day that people would get in the altar and say, God, whatever it takes to bring my boy to you. If, if you take me to a premature grave and save him. And then the truth is. The majority of the people in our churches don't even remember the last time they were in an altar. Let me, let me ask you, preacher, when's the last time you responded to the gospel you preached? I, I wrote a sermon that long ago. I got under such conviction that it was so far beyond what I was living. I rededicated my life, called the Spirit of God as my witness, went into the sanctuary and got a card and filled it out. And that morning when I preached and the ushers came, I handed it to one of them and they dealt with me during the invitation. <laughs> and by the way, it was specific too. I didn't just say I want to rededicate my life. I said, I want to rededicate my life. I come this morning repenting in these areas of my life. And I want to, I want to claim where the locust has stolen. And I want to be what God wants me to be. Yeah. And, and announce it. When y'all announce it, that the preacher got right. The dividing of the cross. Uh, two, two statements. Number one, the dividing of those who are believing. Uh, notice he says in verse 8, he says, those who are being saved. So for you language gurus, present tense participle, passive voice, it means that you can't save yourself. It means you're being acted upon by another. It indicates the inability of those who are being saved to accomplish that end in their own strength. It is God who is acting to save them through his own power. And I'm going to tell you, uh, ladies, God bless you, ladies. Uh, Praise God for you. 
But men, men really struggle more with this fact that even if the Holy Ghost is dealing with them, their attitude is sometimes like, I really would like to surrender to this decision, but I don't feel like I can live up to it. Um, I, I went to church on a Sunday morning with my wife, and we'd been about three weeks in a row. And uh, when I was younger, uh, my dad used to um, discipline us so harshly before he left that he would say, uh, son, uh, if you don't stop your crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. I'll never forget as long as I live. And so I, I, learned, I learned to take pain without tears. Isn't this crazy? I can remember going to my best friend, Wayne Collins. He got killed in a car accident. And I just remember being there. And as sorrowful as I was, no tears. But then I started going to the Baptist church. And, and you may think I'm kidding. I'm, God, the last thing I want to do is be melodramatic. God don't honor that. I want to be honest and truthful. I didn't carry a handkerchief my adult life until I started going to the Baptist church because uh, the Spirit of God was so honoring the Word of God that I was under conviction. Now, I'm using language I didn't know then, but let me, let me give you conviction. Conviction is where the Holy Spirit exposes your sin. Now, let me tell you what we men do before we get saved. We compare ourselves with others. Do you ever do this? I'd, I, I would be on my way to the drag strip, and I would ride by the church I'd later be converted in, and if I saw somebody out there smoking, I was real judgmental. I'd say, if he's going to heaven, so am I. It just made me feel bad. I always compared myself, but when Jesus comes and convicts you, and the Bible says when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. So when he convicted me, you're no longer looking around. God shows you, this is incredible. He shows you his holiness and your hellishness. He just shows you raw who you are, exposes all that inside. And, and all you can do is, is realize you cry out to God for mercy. So I'm, I'm weeping in the service. Service ends and a preacher says this. I love to tell this. I pray I never forget what it was like to be lost. And I pray I never get over getting saved. Do you hear what I just said? I pray I never get over getting saved. Uh, the preacher said, there's a man here this morning, and God's dealing with him. He must have seen my tears and all. And he said, uh, join me in prayer as we close that God would bring him back and save him. And I love it when somebody's more spiritual than me pulls me aside and says, you know, I appreciate your story, but you didn't have to go back to church that night to get saved. No, you don't have to go to a funeral home to die. Um, <laughs> But, um, but I'm going to make a statement I never dreamed would be so relevant for the local church. The church ought to be a place you can go and be offered the opportunity to be saved. Amen. Don't you give the gospel and say goodbye, see you next week. That's not your message to monkey with. I would never prepare a good meal at my home and invite anyone in and not offer them to come and dine. Second yeah. Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20 says that God's making his plea through me as an ambassador for Christ for people to be saved. He says as though God asked them through you. I was witnessing a man the other day and he said, Thanks, sir, Reverend Hunt. Appreciate you witnessing to me. But I just want to be honest with you. When God's ready to save me, he'll let me know. I said, he just did. <laughs> Read your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. I'm telling you, God has given me the authority of an ambassador of Jesus Christ to invite a person to come to the Son of God as though the Spirit of God in me were asking him to come. Study your Bible carefully. I remember telling my wife, I said, I'm going to go to church tonight. And that preacher was talking about me this morning. And how do you know he's talking about you? And by the way, can I say something? When God talks to you, you ain't got to convince him. And by the way, it's not because he's got your number. He knows your name. And so God, God dealt with me that day. And so I didn't go to drag strip. I went back that night. But before I got back, I told my wife, this is stupid. But I'll never forget it. It's just where men live. I said, honey, you know I'm gambling. You know I love a good Red Fox Saloon. Drink it up. I'm telling you, I want to give my life to Christ. And if he don't change me, I'm going to be back down there tomorrow night. And I want to go ahead and just, you need to make a promise to me now. You're not going to hound me. I'm going to go back to my old ways. See, I, I was trying to figure it all out. How's my life going to change? And what I didn't, I didn't realize the power of God in the gospel. Matter of fact, 
I'm going to tell you what I know. And I know some of you got saved you much younger, and I'll say something to you. God, God be the glory. That's incredible. It's awesome. But I was not one of those, so I, I can't tell your story, and you can't tell mine. But I'll tell you this. I've been amazed at how much God changed me. I'm shocked. I, I really am. I, I know who, who I was, and um, he, he changed me. So, so a couple of things in my time is about uh, um, believing from a human side. Listen to this. The world through wisdom did not know him. God wisely established that man could not come to know God by human wisdom. That would exalt man. So God designed to save helpless sinners through the preaching of a message that was so simple that the worldly wise deemed it. Absurdity. Nonsense. So if anyone ever leaves your service and says, you know, you seem to be a nice man. I know you've got a good education. And, but I want you to know that <laughs> it's pure absurdity what you shared this morning. It just tells you where he is. And that's what the, the Bible says. But then believing, that's human side. Believing from heaven's side. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Salvation comes only through faith in the message of the cross. It's, it's not foolish preaching that pleases God. It's the foolishness of the message being preached. So I think it's awesome when a man has a great education, but he preaches a message with, I mean, encouragement and confidence, confidence in the gospel of its power, even though many deem it foolish. So... The proclamation does not refer to the act of declaring a message, but to the content of the message. See, the content of God's message is the gospel, the word of the cross, the power of God. It does not refer, this is good, to a special technique or oral communication. Rather, it pertains to the content of what's declared. So it says, oh, if I could communicate like him, it's not how you communicate, it's the message that you communicate. So somebody could say, oh, if I could preach like him, if I had the mind of a Robbie Zacharias, or if I was articulate like H.B. Charles. But he's not talking about the preaching of worldly wisdom, but the simple, unadorned, uncomplicated truth of the cross of Jesus Christ that allows no place for man's wisdom or man's work or man's glory. So that's to those who are being saved. Then last of all, to those who are perishing. Verse 18, but to those who are perishing, present tense, listen to this. This, this can help your evangelism. It did not describe a future possibility, but rather a present reality. Hey, let me tell you what um, got me in the car, Peyton, and caused me to drive from Wilmington, North Carolina to Pineville, Kentucky to tell my, my dad about Jesus. When I was witnessing him at brother text him the young man was driving he said hey is your brother getting mad that you know you're laying it out there man and I said he's uh I'm the runt of our family Freddie's six two and used to be a cage fighter so he's he's a junkyard dog too I mean mean as a snake but uh but he's always really respected me sometimes he really gets aggravated at me but um when I, I I'm glad you know John three sixteen. and I'll try to wrap it up with this but you need to know John three eighteen. He that believeth not, come on, stay with me, is condemned already. Not, it's like God, I don't know, it's like the lights came off. I used to think, you know, I, I need to get to my dad before it's too late. Or one day my dad's going to be condemned. No, no. Lost people are already present tense perishing. It's interesting, the, the little word that is used there is apoluma. It means the act of perishing has already begun and it will continue unbroken unless there's repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, Southern Baptists are embracing practical. Universalism. Well, my, my dad lived like hell all his life. Drunkard, beat my mama. Mean, mean, mean. But you know, I'm hopeful you never know what he did in his last breath. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I do. He took it and died. 
Who are you trying? Are you trying to comfort yourself with some type of false hope? I'm going to tell you why I have hope. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The cross. Men die the way they live. And if they don't come to Christ, and what makes you think everybody gets spiritual right before they die? So I, I jumped in my car, and I didn't know very much. I weren't a pastor then. I would not taken any courses. And I gotta, I gotta, I'm going to act like I'm finishing, so watch this. <laughs> so I'm closing it all up. Watch all. So I want you to catch this. I'm confident. I'm confident. I know what's going on in our evangelism. We're training people that don't give a half a hallelujah that their neighbors and families are going to hell. Now, let me tell you what the difference was. I hadn't been trained, but I was, I was broken over the lostness of mama, daddy, Norman, Barbara, Mary, Freddie. Brought, all of them have come to Jesus. All of them have been soundly saved, except for Freddie. Still after Freddie. So I went to see my daddy. And some of dad checked out when I was seven. Married again, I think maybe by then already in maybe his third marriage. Children, so I got these, I have brothers and sisters. I'm not being ugly, I just don't even know their name. And so I went to see him, and so I, I needed to break the ice with Dad, so I didn't know what else to say, so I said what I knew to say. And I said, uh, hey, Dad, uh, I got a new father. Oh, I, I didn't know Bessie May got married again. No, she didn't get married. I, I got saved. What would you say then? I didn't know anything else. I just said what I said. But I said, I brought you a gift. Brought you a gift. Okay, son. So he opened it, unwrapped it. It was a rug. I had a man to make him a rug and put on the rug. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in their house. I put it at his front door. I said, Daddy, I pray that every day. I'm, I'm in my 20s. I just want to see Daddy get saved. I hadn't. I didn't know evangelism explosion. And some people take the courses, but they don't have the passion. And you're trying to get them to stay in the game because they've learned intellectually. But I'm telling you, until, until God touches the hearts of Southern Baptists again, study best news, learn three circles, but there's going to be no passion to share it. So the reason I wanted to take evangelism training is so I could become more proficient in doing what I was already doing. We're trying to get people to learn to witness so they can become passionate. Now, you can become proficient, but only the Holy Ghost can make you passionate. Okay. Okay, can't, no one tell one more story. I'll go, okay, I've got to drive back to the airport and catch early flight do the Georgia convention tomorrow. They need it a lot worse than you boys. So <laughs> <laughs> Georgia. <laughs> Somebody will text that and they'll cancel me tonight. <laughs> I'll just give one, one story because I really want to just, I want to leave you with uh, how it all starts. If you'll come to... to um, our special night in February, I preach a totally different message. We should, we should be there and bring you people. We ought to pack that place out. And I'll be with Brother Danny out there in the next year sometime too. It's be great. But, uh, I, went, I went to see Randy. You, you know what I would do when I first got saved? I, I really, I'm going to quit. I'm sorry, Pastor. Oh. But, but anyway, I um, don't, don't start that. I only need about two. <laughs> You know, I've never had another jar to give me about two and I'm, I'm back in there. And no, this is, I, uh, I went, I, I, I'll show the story. I'll play a video of leading my, my absolute life friend to Jesus. It took me 28 and a half years before he came to Christ. And they teach his Sunday school God. But I went to see his brother. And uh, I was by myself and I was a new believer and I had a soul winner's New Testament like Marty uh, Lively makes available over there. And so I would open that. So when there's New Testament, I would read, and it even gives you the question at the bottom. Um, I'd read Romans 3.23. It told me what page it was on. It was underlined in red. And at the bottom it would say, ask, do you know you're a sinner? 
And then when you get acknowledgement there, then you take them and you go to Romans 5, 8, and Romans 6, 23, and then Romans 10, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So that's what I learned. So I shared that with Randy. And when I got to the end, Randy, any reason you not be willing to turn from your sins and place your faith in Christ today? He said, I'm not, I'm not ready. And thanks for coming by, but uh, I'm not. I've heard enough. I don't, I'm not ready. I said, okay, Randy. I said, but I, I want to encourage you. And I'd been studying, and I was a new Christian. And guess what I'd been studying? The book of Revelation. <laughs> so I said, Randy, I want to encourage you not to put this off. And he said, well, I, I, I won't. I promise you I won't. But I said, Randy, you're not even promised tomorrow. And I said, I was, I was reading just today that there's coming a day that God's going to turn scorpions loose on this earth. <laughs> and, and the Bible says, the Bible says the scorpions will sting you and it'll hurt so bad that you'll pray for the mountains to fall on you. And the Bible even says the mountains will flee. So I'm, I just want to encourage you. Do it. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, under God. And you may say, why are you sharing that? I'd rather take what I found in the Bible and share with them than to be a seminary graduate. And no, I mean to be able to just set an exegete, whatever you want to say about it, every language you know, and never use the simple truth you know to tell anybody how to get saved. We've got to get back to the basics. Randy called me the next day and he said, man, I'll tell you what, I appreciate you coming by. Man, don't do that anymore. And I said... I said, what's wrong? He said, you know I'm an electrician. I've always had confidence, but every time I got ready to put two wires together today, I thought if I touched the wrong wire, the scorpions are going to get me. I'll, I'll never forget it as long as I live. And just for the record's sake, I've heard people talk about their early day witnessing and make fun of it. I'm not making fun. Whatever I knew, I told them. And I know a whole lot more now than I knew then. And, I'm, and to whom much has been given much is required. God, help Alabama Baptist, Pastor Johnny, all of us to God lay that soul on my heart. Love that soul for me. Get back to knocking on doors, turning your, your conversations into gospel conversations and leading people to Christ. My last day at Woodstock is December the 1st. And I'll baptize a mother and a son that I led to Christ in my office. And it may not mean much to you. Some of your teenagers would like to hear this. But I just led Lindsay Chrisley to the Lord off the Chrisleys. And God's radically changed that old gal's life. And some of you said, well, I don't know who that is. Well, I didn't either until she started coming to our church and I watched her stupid program. But, uh, <laughs> but she, she's coming to faith in Christ. And her whole family's coming for their baptism. And I'm telling you, I'm going to preach the gospel. And they need the gospel. You heard it. God bless you. Thank you for letting me come. Wow.